here in Saudi Arabia, they've got this tourist attraction called the Edge of the World. And if you have a look at it, you can see why they call it that. standing now is in the Al Ula Chardon Resort near the Al Ula World Heritage Protected Site. It's an incredible place. And that's me on the mirrored building. This is one of the most bizarre buildings I have ever seen. So what brings me to Saudi Arabia on this trip is the regional directors and the director general of the International Conservation Union's regional meeting where we're going to talk about the preservation of the Arabian Leopard as I'm on the board of the Arabian Leopard Fund. People ask me why I like travelling so much. Well, it's because of scenes like this that makes life worthwhile. Come and join me, come and join me. Two of the world's greatest conservationists of some of the most endangered species in the world. And here is another endangered species. There we go. Stay on the light. We are on video, you know. <laughs> this is not a photograph. <laughs> yeah. Hi, and welcome to the Sharon Nature Reserve. Now, I've said a couple of times on the board of the Arabian Leopard Fund. Now, what is the Arabian Leopard Fund? Well, it was set up by the Royal Commission for Al Ula, which is a commission set up by the Saudi government to protect the historic, cultural and natural heritage around the Ula area. And here you get to see some of the most amazing species, plant life and history. So here we're about to have a look at some of the revegetation programs and the restoration programs of the natural heritage here. Now, what's that got to do with the preservation of a leopard? So the Arabian Leopard Fund, run by a bloke named Dr. Honey Tatwani. Honey, hi. Tell everyone. How many Arabian leopards are there and why do we need to protect them? Well, actually in the wild, uh, we don't know exactly how many, but we think there are less than 200. The, the range have been shrunk and the numbers have been shrunk into more than 90% of uh, the original uh, coexistence in, in, in the wild. And now in captivity, we have two uh, scientifically managed uh, captive breeding programs, totaling about 60 to 70 animals. And there are a few others in, in uh, private collections in total about a hundred animals in, in captivity. And in, in, in many cases, actually, captive breeding is going to be the only hope to bring this animal back simply because uh, there is no uh, animals uh, officially reported in or, or scientifically reported in Saudi Arabia since, what, 2014? And that was a, a killed animal. So uh, for Saudi Arabia, the, only, the real option is captive breeding now. So the historical range of the Arabian leopard would go from Sharjah in UAE down through Oman into Yemen across into Saudi Arabia but this traditional range has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and really about the only place left in the wild on around the Yemen border Oman area? Yes Oman and Yemen and perhaps uh, the border between the uh, Saudi and Oman uh, Saudi and Yemen. So tell me why is it important that we re-green the place? <laughs> well without having vegetation the um, animals the herbivores, mm -hmm. um, the small animals that are going to be feeding the leopards, won't have anything to eat. Plus, they give shade. So the trees here can also mm -hmm. provide shade so that the antelope and the other animals can be underneath it, and mm -hmm. that will provide life. So we grow the trees to feed the herbivores so the leopards can eat them. Absolutely. It's a great cycle. Yeah. <laughs> it's called nature. Here we are at the Shrong Gate. Entrance to the reserve. 
what a magnificent place this is. The, the scale and the grandeur of this. And I need a look into the geological history and see how close Saudi and Australia were in the Gondwanaland period because so much of this reminds me of parts of Australia. I'm thinking Catherine Gorge in the Northern Territory, Bungle Bungles in the Western Australia. And you can see through the markings on the rocks that imagine what it's like in the wet season as the water is coming running down and you can see because of these marks on the rocks, the waterfalls and the rivulets that would be here. What a spectacular place this is. And it's into this terrain that we need to reintroduce the Arabian leopard, but more importantly, not just the leopard, you've got to make sure the environment they're going into will sustain them. You need to win over local cultures local villages, local towns, for them to accept a new predatory carnivore coming into their territory and threatening their livestock. So the issues that need to be covered when you talk about protecting an endangered species, it's about protecting the entire ecosystem that they're part of. These are some of the local rangers here, all from the local towns and villages around here. Thank you. Shukran. Oh. This is a different uh, era than these ones. But you can see so many informations for the old people that lived here and the uh, natural animals that lived here and their way of life more than 7,000 years like of different civilizations. Clearly you've got horses and camels and hunters and great historical records here of the people that have lived and thrived here for millennia. Here is what's left over from the number two city of the Nebataeans. The Nebataeans are very well known for their most famous architecture and the capital of their kingdom, Petra. The Nebataeans came out of the Arabian desert and probably reached their pinnacle from 3, 3rd century BC to the 1st century BC. They were known as traders and got their power from their wealth. They were invaded and beaten and attacked by people such as Herod the Great and Cleopatra, but they maintained their independence until about the year 103 AD when they were absorbed into the Roman Empire. The Saudis are pretty proud of having Hegra because in 2008 it was the first Saudi site onto the World Heritage List. However, in the Hadiths, it's mentioned that God punished the city here for worshipping idols and it had a reputation for centuries as being cursed and an area of bad luck. And one of the challenges that the government of Saudi has is to convince the Saudis that this place is not cursed. So before the Nabataeans, about 900 BC, were the Dedanites. And the Dedanites ruled the capital of the Dedanite kingdom from Dedan, which is here and they buried themselves there, up on the caves. Now, how did the Dedanites and the Nabataeans make them money? Well, they controlled the spice route, which essentially went across from India, Horn of Africa, up the Arabian Peninsula, and onto Egypt. And by controlling that spice route and being known as trusted traders, they were able to make all their money. And that's what gave them influence. Stunning place, really.